I um, studied electrical engineering at ETH of uh, Zurich. That's also where I got in touch with the people of PX4, where it all started. Um, I'm a maintainer since 2017 with a focus on multi-rotors, hence also the talk. Um, I'm software engineer now for guidance navigation control at Oterian. Uh, here are some of my links, uh, some nice pictures of my early starts in 2012 with drones. It's a good uh, example of how not to design a multi-rotor and I will talk now about what to do better. And on the right side, you see some of my precious outdoor hobbies. Um, what vehicles are we talking about? PX4 supports a lot of nice vehicle types. I'm only going to talk about what I think are the most popular ones, which are multi-rotors. I'm going to touch a little bit on helicopters, but I don't have enough time to go into too much detail there. Now about the design process. Um, I have a few hints because I see a lot of companies trying to fulfill their, their requirements at once. So they, for example, want to deliver something that is 20 kilograms heavy and they jump directly to the final design, which is not a good idea in my experience. So a few hints, start small, do a small aircraft first, tune that, find all the issues, get familiar with PX4, uh, you will save a lot of time. It's not a waste of time to start small. Build prototypes, simulation will not replace that, so do a lot of flight testing. Uh, prioritize robustness, so manual flight, manually piloted flight performance will tell you if your system will perform also for your requirements in the end use case. And only after that start to test uh, proof of concept with payloads and go to the limits of your vehicle. Iterations are key here, that's pretty obvious. And uh, an example is a big drone, so to arrive at this big drone I think there are a lot of iterations going into it. You cannot arrive at that in the first try. So let's briefly talk about the number of rotors. I see companies uh, trying to prioritize certain amount of rotors. I want to include helicopters because they are the more most efficient design aerodynamically, but they come with a lot of complexity. That's why in the end, I think a lot of companies don't use them. You could add rotors like a big copter or tricopter, but you still need servers to tilt some of the rotors. So there's some compromise in there. So we arrive at the quad rotor design, which is mechanically somewhat of, of an optimum because you have five moving parts. That's also why it's very popular. It's mechanically very simple. So I would probably recommend to go with this design if you don't have any specific requirements. Now there are all the other multi-rotors, so you can have six, eight, whatever, add as many rotors as you want. I generally don't think that's a good idea. There is some argument if you have a restricted size, but you need to produce a lot of thrust, then you basically trade off efficiency to achieve that. The redundancy argument I am not a fan of. It's good marketing, but uh, otherwise design your quadcopter to be uh, robust, as, as I said. Add a parachute and uh, you will be better off than adding a lot of rotors and making your design more complex, just in my experience. So how does a quad rotor work? Basically, you have a lot of rotors that are in a planner design. So if you ramp them all up, you get what I would call a collective thrust that propels the uh, vehicle upwards. So we can accelerate only in one direction in principle. And if we want to fly to some location, we need to rotate that direction to accelerate sideways. So that's why differential thrust, so the difference of thrust between the rotors is really important. Keep that in mind, because if your differential thrust control doesn't work well, your drone will not fly well. Um, the yaw rotation, basically you want to stabilize that and maybe keep the drone uh, heading the right direction, uh, basically only comes from rotor drag if all the motors are uh, at the same level. So I recommend to cant them a little bit. Uh, you can look up the paper, but basically here's just a graph on how to do that to help with your control. The airframe, of course, should be stiff, like carbon and aluminum offer themselves as materials there. And your center of gravity should be roughly centered in the vehicle. Otherwise, you just waste energy trying to uh, keep it level. Now to design a powertrain, 
the most important thing here, the key takeaway is latency. Your differential thrust control needs to be good and latency is key to that. So whenever you add any delay with bad design, an ESC that doesn't respond fast, your vehicle will never fly good. That's the crucial point. Of course, you need to size your vehicle right. I linked the calculator. You need to have enough thrust margin, so don't fly at the limit. Without payload full battery, you certainly want to be below 50% hover thrust. Uh, but the latency in the end is crucial to have good flight performance. And uh, by good ESCs here, I mean you need to test the ESCs yourself. Don't uh, rely on the marketing claims. Every ESC is good in marketing. You need to really test that yourself. And uh, duty cycle control, just as a hint, offers itself because usually it has the lowest latency on ESCs. Now we all know the vibration problem. Uh, with the vibration problem, it's also a matter of trying out with prototypes. If you have vibration problems, you need to solve them really in hardware. The software will not make vibrations go away. You can kind of work around a little bit, but you need to have hardware solution for vibration problems. And real world testing here is really key. So don't try to guesstimate what will, what will work better and go for uh, design directly, but rather test a lot and find a good solution. Um, what are sources for vibrations? Of course, the rotors, if they're imbalanced, rattling components, so don't make these huge uh, GPS masks that uh, just add, add resonances also to the airframe. And uh, flight control mount is also important, so isolate your flight control a little bit, but keep it roughly hard mounted, maybe with a bit of O-rings, uh, double-sided tape works really well. Yeah, and avoid uh, mounting it on large plates because those resonate. Now in terms of setup, I want to really have an emphasis on safety first. So in the previous presentation, we saw a small drone you could maybe hold with the propellers on. I say no to that. Don't hurt yourself, don't hurt anyone else. Uh, drones are really cool, but also dangerous. So really stick to the rules. As soon as a drone is powered, um, if the propellers are on, keep your safety distance, never arm the drone when it's close to you. It will be not worth it. Your life is worth a lot. Uh, the vehicle can be replaced. Now in terms of configuration, I, Alex already covered most of it. I want to put an emphasis on, on the ESC setup, so on the actuators. Um, really make sure before you do any flight or any further uh, configuration that your limits, like the minimum and maximum of your ESC uh, protocol are configured correctly. So that means at the minimum, the ESC should turn the motor robustly and not produce significant thrust. At the maximum, it should stop increasing the thrust. If these are wrong, you will have problems later on. Um, I added the videos that I already used in the last uh, Dev Summit presentation. I currently don't have time to go through all of these, but uh, download the PDF and look at the videos, they're public. Now you can do the first flight. Uh, there are also videos. I recommend you check them out. Um, I would do that first flight in stabilized because it's much easier to pilot. You make sure air mode is disabled to avoid the worst flips, uh, which is also the default. And then you do a careful check on the ground. Uh, Alex already mentioned that it resists uh, rotation and that it reacts to your sticks already on the ground, that you see it does the right thing. Otherwise, go back and uh, restart the setup. Um, at this point, if you get off the ground uh, successfully, auto-tuning is possible, but I want to go into more detail in terms of what I do in, uh, on tuning. Um, rate control tuning is maybe the hardest, but also the most crucial. Um, I would say you need to fly in acro mode because that way you can provide the set points, uh, the rate set points to directly allow you to evaluate how the rate controller works. I listed here the two main gain parameters, which you should probably uh, like change first symmetrically. Um, your goal in terms of testing is that you have low drift when you let go of the sticks in acro mode. Um, you can do 
minus to uh, minus to plus 100 degrees per second steps, which is also the default in your version of PX4. So you go all the way to the right and to the left of the sticks and uh, see that the flight performance is very predictable for the pilot. No, no overshoots, no surprises there. And you can let the stick snap back. And uh, I mean, the stick oscillates a little bit, but you don't want any overshoot there and crazy oscillations. You will see that if you did so far everything right, so if your vehicle is well designed, the tuning should be easy. Now, uh, a word about filters. I, I said you need to solve vibrations in hardware. Still, most, most vehicles have some kind of vibrations, and for that we have filters for the remaining vibrations, so you can work around those. Here is an example of a vibration peak at a certain frequency. Like Alex already said, you can enable high rate logging. You will find in the FFT what your problem area is and either change the cutoff, which I would not lower the default anymore. You can put it higher if your drone is low on vibrations. But if you have a peak, like in this example, you can put a notch filter on that. And th those are also the parameters that you would set for that. Then you can continue with attitude control tuning. Only do that if rate control works well. Otherwise, go back to the drawing board, do iterations. In terms of attitude control, you want to change these two parameters, which are the main gains, again, symmetrically. And uh, I would say the attitude gain largely depends on the inertia of your vehicle, so on the size and weight of it. And I put like rough guesstimates of the size of the drone, what you will probably end up using as a gain. You can tune that uh, a little bit, of course. And your goal is that you really can go hard and put a lot of input on the sticks diagonally, all sides, all frequencies of stick input, and you will have a robust flight performance. So it will never overshoot, flip over, or anything like that. That's really the foundation for autonomous flying. So. You can, of course, continue tuning all the details in terms of a yaw control. I would check that in altitude mode because it's much easier to pilot. You can do velocity tuning. For that, I uh, recommend to use the aggressive mode by changing the MPC post mode parameter. But basically, if you've done everything right until now, I would say the rest of the tuning is less crucial and you can give yourself more time. You will have like solid autonomous flying at this point. Now, in terms of operations, so you have your flying drone, the first thing I would do is check the fail-safes. Because if you fly further off, if you rely on the drone, what will happen? Your battery goes empty or you lose your link because you're too far away. And you want to first make sure that these two things are configured accordingly. So you want to verify that your best battery estimate is correct and that the link loss fail-safe is set as you would expect it, such that you don't lose your vehicle. Um, I have a link to the safety docs. Those are the most important parts here on the slide. Um, then in terms of flying, the easiest mode to fly manual in is uh, position mode. It's very intuitive to fly. It's like a DJI drone. It, ju it just hovers and you can give some input to move it. It's very useful for safety pilots. That's also why we have the feature RC override. So if you're in an autonomous mode and you move the sticks, um, it will automatically switch to position mode. You can disable that. You can put exceptions such that if you fly autonomously, it will not fail safe if you lose the sticks because that's the default. You want to always uh, keep the sticks for safety piloting. Then the autonomous modes, you can use them in an ad hoc manner. So you can press the takeoff button, press somewhere on the map, go to on the ground station, place an orbit to make it circle somewhere, land there or return, you are probably familiar with that, or you go through the full mission workflow where you plan the entire mission beforehand, you place a takeoff, a few waypoints, decide if you want to return autonomously afterwards, upload the mission and start it. Now a few words about helicopter support because I didn't touch really on that part. Uh, we have helicopter allocation support in PX4, so you can configure your three or four servo swash plate for helicopters. Uh, you can configure the tail as a separate motor or a variable pitch um, like uh, that is attached to the main rotor motor. 
and we have main motor RPM control, uh, which is something that a lot of helicopters need. Um, all the other controllers, everything that comes on top is shared with multi-rotor. And the big advantage is it's all there, it all works. The disadvantage is uh, for altitude control, there's no conservation of energy in the controller. So you might end up in blade stall in some crazy situations with the helicopter. So that could be extended. And the other part is the guidance does not include any forward flying efficiency benefits of a helicopter so that we would look forward to contributions uh, on that side. Now I still have some time for questions. So, so the question is, what do I recommend for a uh, reading material for VTOL setup? So we have documentation for all the vehicle types in PX4. Uh, a VTOL is basically a multi-rotor, so everything that I just said applies to also to VTOLs with uh, a fixed wing attached to it. So you should uh, check fixed wing multi-rotor documentation and the combination. That's what I recommend. And uh, I think first you want to get it to hover properly and then uh, later on start to transition and get it to fly nicely in fixed wing such that you can always recover back into your robust multi-rotor control. One, here we go. Hi, thanks. Uh, you talked about uh, the GPS being on a long pole, right? And that's yes. an issue. Yes. Um, but also the recommend is make sure you keep that bad boy this far away from the flight controller. Yes. So you got sort of two competing interests there. So that is true. And so I looked at your pictures and I saw a poll and a lot of them. So do you have a recommend? How would you solve that problem? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a good question. It's a really good question. I, I would certainly not recommend a poll like in my picture that is really thin. So if you have a poll at all, make sure it's stiff and doesn't like resonate at low frequencies. Um, I would say try to mount it maybe even on an arm slightly out or at the top of your flight control bay and check that the performance is good like that. So you want to mount it away certainly from your radio like for communication because that interferes and you want to mount it away from batteries and high current lines because usually the magnetometer is inside. So try on top of the autopilot bay away from strong magnetic fields and if that doesn't work, maybe slightly on the arm, like the beginning of the arm. And if that doesn't work, then you need a little pole that's very stiff. So that's the compromise, I would say. All right. Thank you so much, Matthias. Thank you.